it's good to see you all here, except um, you all look so young, it's making me feel very old. Um, and I feel particularly old at the moment, because the other day was my 50th birthday. Um, and uh, that's exactly the right response, thank you very much. Um, and actually, thinking back uh, to when I was growing up, uh, it's quite instructive, and it almost takes an effort of will now to remember what Europe looked like uh, when I was younger than you. Half of Europe was dominated by Soviet dictatorships enforced at the barrels of tanks. Southern Europe uh, had a string of military dictatorships or uh, nominal democracies that frequently flipped into military <coughs> dictatorship through coups. Spain was still a fascist uh, country, effectively, run by the Falange. Um, so the map of democratic free Europe was quite thin and fragile looking at the time. And we grew up under the shadow of the Cold War, thinking, actually, this wasn't guaranteed to be uh, something that would last our whole lifetimes. And the, one of the reasons I joined what was then called the Liberal Party uh, was this vision that European liberals had, Western European liberals, I guess, mainly in that, in that era, was this vision of the whole of Europe being a federation of free democracies. And this felt like, a, in some ways, like a pipe dream at the time, but it was a very inspiring vision. And I sometimes still have to pinch myself to realise that that vision has more or less come to pass. That from, uh, from Estonia to Portugal, uh, we now have that Federation of Free Democracies. And it's an extraordinary achievement. If you've studied world history, this is almost unprecedented that an entire continent can come together in peace and cooperation. And I have to say, somebody put it very well earlier on today. Uh, someone who is sometimes painted as a bit of a Eurosceptic, uh, and from Rob Sparta, which is our Foreign Secretary, William Hague, that he made a speech today on the future of, of Britain in Europe, in which he said the European Union, alongside NATO, has been an instrument of peace and reconciliation. It has helped to spread and entrench democracy and the rule of law across Europe. It has helped make armed conflict between its members unthinkable. Um, he had to go all the way to Berlin to make it safely from his own party. <laughs> but at least he said it, okay? At least he said it, and I think that's very positive. I mean, my role uh, as, as chair of the, the Liberal Democrat uh, Committee <coughs> on International Affairs, I do meet William on a fairly regular basis, and we always try and encourage him to speak out for what he does now, I mean, very genuinely believe, and acts on in very practical ways as Foreign Secretary. Uh, that our future does lie within the European Union. And it is still quite a controversial thing uh, within his party, but uh, we're encouraging him to say it more. The reason that um, a lot of people talk about the benefits of Europe is to do with the single market. And I think on the Conservative uh, benches in Parliament, this is the, the big, great achievement. And indeed, that's uh, William talked about that as well today. In fact, he came up with such a good little snippet. I'm going to quote him a second time. Um, I don't normally quote Conservative politicians all the time, this isn't a great name. but we're on a cross-party basis here, so this is very good. Um, but we said, um, someone in Britain can go through a whole day dependent on the single market. A poll, one of half a million living in our country, can leave their home, he did courtesy of a German company, E.ON, catch a bus owned by a French company, R.A.T.P., make a phone call using a Franco-German provider, Orange, on a Nokia phone from Finland, and stop to get the money from uh, stop to get their money from a Spanish bank, Santander. Others may preach Europe, but Britain practices it. Well, that last claim might be a bit strong, but the point is, uh, I think the, the virtue of the single market and the fact that we are so integrated now into the European economy is one of the reasons why, for anyone uh, with a basic understanding of economics, the idea of us withdrawing from that uh, should be unthinkable. Um, I mean, if the, some Eurosceptics often talk about the example of Norway. Um, I don't know how many of them know that Euro uh, Norway pays 550 million euros a year to the European Union as a kind of administration fee for its participation in various uh, EU programs. Um, they are in the situation, I mean, uh, William Hague, in a, in a former, slightly more Eurosceptic incarnation, coined the phrase that he wanted Britain to be in Europe but not run by Europe. Well. Uh, Norway is out of Europe, but still run by Europe, <laughs> because they actually, to, in order to gain access to that, um, that uh, now what is it, 12 trillion uh, euro market, they need to um, comply with all the rules of the single market, but they play absolutely no part 
in actually forming those rules. They have no seat at that table. So they have to comply with lots of European rules in the way that our Eurosceptics <coughs> complain about, uh, but they actually have no, no role in, in setting them. And there is a risk, of course, if we withdrew from, from the European Union, that actually the European Union countries that remain might be a bit re less relaxed about allowing access to European markets to Britain uh, than they are to countries like Norway, which don't pose a great uh, economic threat. I mean, would they be as sympathetic or as understanding of the special position, for instance, of the City of London and our banks if we were outside the European Union? I'm not sure they would at all. So I think uh, with Rob that it would be taking an enormous risk uh, to withdraw in that way. But there are far more reasons why uh, you should be in favour of remaining within the European Union. Consumer protection, let's take that one for a start. Uh, if you, I mean, it's uh, roughly my kids' bedtime now, um, and they're going to bed cuddling cuddly toys, which are all safe because there is a little E label on every single one. And we can be sure that wherever those toys are sourced from, that they comply with European safety standards when we go on holiday. We carry European health insurance cards that now mean that wherever we go in Europe, uh, we can be sure of the same um, health benefits. We make mobile phone calls that are 50% cheaper <coughs> within the European Union. And in fact, if you send a text message, I think it's 70% cheaper um, because of European consumer protection law. And if you don't believe me, try going to North America and making a mobile phone call from there. Um, cheaper to fly back and talk to people in face to face. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've got... <coughs> You've got um, airlines, if you choose to pollute the environment in this way. Um, airlines are uh, cheaper within Europe because of <coughs> European rules. And I, there's an amazing statistic I was given earlier on today that um, since 1993, when consumer protection around holiday companies came in, 1.1 million Britons have been <coughs> flown home uh, with their, their, at least their, their wallets intact, if not their holidays, um, after their holiday companies went bust, again, as a result of European consumer protection. Then there's Europe's role within the world. The idea that any one of 27 different countries could have the same weight within international negotiations is fantasy. Uh, we are negotiating free trade agreements between the European Union and Japan, Canada, India. Uh, we couldn't do that as 27 different countries and have the same impact. We're participating in everything from the Arms Trade Treaty to the uh, Rio Summit, which uh, is helping and the subsequent process following the Rio Summit to set this new sustainable development goals uh, for developing countries. We're participating in things like international sanctions on Iran, uh, on a uh, 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 European basis. We're participating in the UNFCCC, the, the climate change negotiations, again, as the European Union, overwhelmingly. And there's a brilliant photograph um, of Chris Hune, actually, at the Durban summit, basically <coughs> sitting at the top table along with um, uh, China and other global economies like this, trying to thrash out the details of the, the latest stage of that climate change process. And I'm not talking metaphorically, it is literally sitting at a table, it's about this big. Uh, Chris Hune's sitting here, the Americans are sitting here, the others are sitting round it, and all the other delegates are sort of sitting looking over them. You can see the photograph of this top table on the, on the internet. And um, the idea that, again, we would be at that top table as just Britain on its own is fanciful. Uh, that we, he was there because he was <coughs> speaking for the whole of, of Europe. Um, in terms of our safety and security, the European arrest warrant is used to bring uh, dozens, probably hundreds, of suspects back from European countries to face trial in this country. Gloucestershire Constabulary, my own police force, um, last year participated in the breaking up of a human, one of the largest human trafficking rings uh, that's been operating across Europe. Um, and they used the European arrest warrant to bring a local suspect <coughs> back to Gloucestershire to face trial. The same has been used against serious and organized crime, against terrorists, um, against um, uh, people trafficking, and so on. So these are, these are really important uh, collaborative efforts that, again, would be put at risk if we were to withdraw uh, from Europe. And there are some Eurosceptics who are very cross about the European arrest warrant and see this as some infringement of our sovereignty, you know. So I've, I have suggested from time to time that we could indeed uh, pull out of all these justice and home affairs cooperative measures. Um, uh, we'll just restrict our justice and home affairs uh, things to the UK, <coughs> providing we can get all the organised criminals and uh, drug traffickers and human traffickers and terrorists to sign up to only operate in the UK and not to go across borders. I don't think that's very likely, personally. So I think the message is there are very many reasons um, why Britain needs to stay in Europe. I think on the economic front, we are at a dangerous 
moment in Europe's history. And there are various outcomes that can come from the impetus now taking place within the core of the Eurozone towards greater integration, towards banking union, and towards um, more economic integration, and which will really create a kind of fast track of, of European Union. If that collapses and it's a disaster and the Eurozone collapses, that's a bad outcome for us. If actually it doesn't quite come off and we kind of carry on muddling through and we have a kind of stagnant European economy, uh, that's not a very good outcome for Britain either. But it may be quite a risky outcome if it succeeds. Because the centre of gravity, the economic centre of gravity of Europe will have shifted somewhat. And we will have to work quite hard to make sure that we don't look as though we've been left on the outside. And this, if I have a criticism of, of William and the way he's presented government policy on Europe, it's that still the script is rather a lot about what we're going to try and pull back from Europe and how we're going to sort of withdraw from little bits. And it does kind of create the impression that we're heading for the exit door. And that is a dangerous thing for us to give the impression, uh, uh, that's a dangerous impression for us to give to our European partners because they may believe it. And even if actually uh, at the last minute we say, oh no, we didn't actually mean leave, you know, as such, you know, we want to stay sort of involved, we'll find that, that the game has moved on. And that is quite a dangerous moment for us. So on all these re all, for all these reasons, uh, but most of all, I think, because um, of the amazing achievement of the European Union in cementing peace and democracy across the whole European continent, which is one of the most extraordinary political achievements, I think probably the most polit extraordinary political achievement of my lifetime, um, then I think uh, the answer to the question, do we have a future in Europe, is absolutely yes. Thank you.